Good morning to uh, Homegrown. Um, we've been shut for a, a year and it's so great to have actually people back into the club in our Montague. Um, London is buzzing, tubes were quite busy this morning, I don't know how your commute was into, into town. But it is just great to have our entrepreneurs and investors and, and trusted advisors back into our club. Um, we work with a lot of partners and with James it is great to host an event uh, like this and with some amazing speakers. Now, James can introduce himself and his, uh, his panel. I think he will be much better to, to do so uh, than me as general manager here in the club. Um, but if you would like to have a browse around after um, this event, by all means, uh, your house or homegrown is our house. And um, please have a look around and enjoy the talk to this morning. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, we're incredibly humbled uh, by the assembled panel and, and guests. Um, I have to be honest, it's uh, beyond the white line for those of you that don't know much about us. I know some of you will be here for these incredible speakers and it'll be your first opportunity to be introduced to us. We are an organization that was set up with the sort of human in mind. Um, back in late 2018, I, I moved away from the music industry um, and that lived experience really fed into the change I wanted to see brought about um, in, in industry, not just in sport, but across many industries where you see humans commoditized and put into that institutionalized state. Um, and to that end, Gone the White Line was born and, you know, three years down the line, it's been a lot of, lot of uh, work has gone along, a lot of research and development and building the operational model. And I'm proud to say that we're now operationally live um, across sport. We're working with up to 22 clubs across the Football League and Premier League. We're working with partners such as Katarina Johnson-Thompson, Team GB Athlete and her academy, uh, Kadena Cox and her academy and some other incredibly exciting things that are, that are afoot. Um, what I would say is that to give you a deeper understanding of that, we are focused on people, not profit and performance. Our organization is all about putting that person first. So whether it's their mental well-being, their physical well-being, their education, their career, and we take quite seriously our responsibility that goes beyond that in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion that we're here to discuss today. Issues of, and challenges of racism and homophobia in sport and gender equity and all, all, all manner of challenges that we see on a daily basis. And we really want to take a solution-led approach to that. That is everything that matters to us. It's not about rhetoric and talk and, and you know, we are here to talk and discuss that today, but with a solution in mind and what can we achieve and what can these outcomes and these aims be? So I'm really grateful for your presence today and your contribution. Please make this an immersive session. If you wish to ask questions, there'll be plenty of opportunity. Do so, get involved in the conversation. If you want to support Beyond the White Line, please do get in touch and support us. If we can support you, let us know in whatever industry, organization, business that you're in. We may have other partners, some included here today, that can help support you. Um, but I won't dwell any longer on ourselves. Let's get to the speakers involved. I have done because this isn't my forte, as you'll, uh, as you'll understand. So that's why I've engaged these incredible people uh, so that they can be at the front of the room. So I've, I've got some notes here because I really don't want to do them a disservice um, by, by sort of missing any keynotes in the introduction. So I would like to briefly uh, introduce you, I suppose, and then they'll come up together to some of the speakers that we've got here today. Um, at the front of the room here to my, to my left and your right, we've got Rene Carriol, MBE. I mean, um, I'm already feeling uh, like I should step a little bit further away <laughs> um, of Inspired Leaders Network. Um, Rene is a keynote speaker and is in incredibly inspirational and, and also helps coach chief execs and business leaders on inclusion. Um, you really should look into some of Rene's work and, and the stuff that is available out there um, across media platforms. It's incredible and we're you know, incredibly grateful to Rene to be here today uh, and I'm sure we'll have a big contribution. Um, Radha Balani of Beyond Sport and Think Beyond, helping organizations and individuals and communities find their purpose and have impact through sport. These do not do these speakers justice, these, these introductions, let me tell you. You're in for a treat. Jamie Hooper, formerly of Sport England, now founder of Inclusive Cultures on Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Sport. Um, we, Jamie is also announcing today an incredible event within the space uh, that you will see and, and hopefully he'll talk about uh, towards the end of the session today uh, that's planned for next year. Jason Weber, Head of Diversity, Inclusion and Integrity at the Football Association of Wales. I don't want to inflate anyone's ego here, but what Jason is doing in that space, in an, an association on the ground, is game-changing. What he shared with us last night, 
incredible work and please do press him on that and get him to give you some spoilers and, and, and early, uh, early insight. Christian Hurley, strategy director of Um and After Party Studios, humanizing athletes through the medium of entertainment. We spoke two years ago about the work that Christian and, and the team plan to do. And they really want to ensure that through that medium of entertainment, we see a, a human side to these athletes. Not this disconnect that we constantly see where you know they're commoditized and, and people don't see the human behind the athlete, therefore they treat them a certain way. They're trying to bring that human element forward so that we can really reconnect and understand that these are people. Um, and certainly not uh, least, but last is Nubaid Haroon, multifaceted broadcaster across sport, including motorsport, football, cricket. I mean, if you haven't seen him already, you, you will see a lot of, of this gentleman coming moving forward. Um, Nubaid is passionate about representation within media. Um, and, you know, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but if you can't, you know, if you can't see it, how can you be it? And that is so important. And Nubay's own experience in the landscape of, of broadcast media and, and as he's come up and had more exposure, you know, he's firsthand had experience of some of the challenges that we're going to discuss today. So an incredible panel, hopefully an incredible talk today. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to hand over to Nubay to, to kick off the conversation. I'd like to invite the speakers to the front of the room. Thank you so much. You got this. <laughs> seat's a long way up you know I'm definitely not tall enough for this seat uh, thank you everyone for coming out um, obviously I'm, I'm sort of facilitating the conversation but I felt as though starting the conversation the best way would be to pos probably speak about one of my experiences um, also I, I look extremely ropey this morning because I was vomiting about four hours ago uh, and then James was like you better get down here and I was like yeah yeah I'm there. um <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. To be, to be fair, he didn't at all. And uh, I just had some Barocca. So we're good to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. I'm negative. All good. Double jabbed as well. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, uh, so I, I felt as though I should probably kick this off with one of my own personal experiences. Um, and James obviously refers to me as Nabade, but like my internet name is Rambo. Um, which sounds really cool. Uh, and, it, and it has been for a long while. And the name unfortunately was born out of like a racial incident um but for a long time i felt as though that was quite cool and not the, not the part that i was ra like happened because of racism more so the fact that i got a cool nickname uh so from the age of like 12 everybody would be like oh rambo and nobody's gonna forget the asian kid called rambo uh who had a beard at the age of 13 like, I, I was so popular it was the best thing ever um but then as I've got older, I realized that, um, and only recently actually since meeting my wife, I realized that um, I'm sort of like hiding behind the name uh, because she said to me, I refuse to call you Rambo. Um, I couldn't believe it, to be honest. I thought it was disgraceful. <laughs> but, um, um, she's like, I'm, I'm going to call you Nabade, and my dad is definitely not going to call you Rambo. Um, so yeah, they all started calling me Nabade. I almost like forgot what my name was because I've been Rambo this whole, this whole time and uh, I guess, like, especially from my background, playing football my whole life, it was like being Rambo on the football pitch was the best thing ever because everyone's like, oh, we've got a macho man in our team. He's five foot eight, but he's definitely still a macho man. Um, and then as, as time's gone on, uh, and as I met Dan, who will be in the room at some point, um, he was like, you have to be in the He's like, you can't be Rambo anymore because you're, you're hiding behind this fake alias, which makes you feel like you're strong. But it was a name that was given to you because people couldn't say Nabaid. So I'd pick the phone up and I'd be like, oh, he's Nabaid. And people were like, what's that, sorry? Uh, and you wouldn't believe some of the attempts of Nabaid that I've heard. Um, and so I'd just go, yeah, it's Rambo, actually. Uh, to the point where I was saying Naz, who's my brother, it's just much easier to remember. So, so people were calling me, like, oh, hi, is this Naz? I'm like, oh, he's in the room. And then I'd pass the phone to him. He's like, I don't think I've ever spoken to this person before. But that was because I was, I was being him the whole time. Um, and then, yeah, then sort of like almost reinvented my own personality as an abade and realized that actually the reason I wanted to be Rambo is because I didn't see an abade on TV or I didn't see an abade in football or I didn't see an abade in cricket. Um, and so I like detached myself from who I was basically, a young South Asian boy from Bradford. Um, and even to the point where people would say, oh, what did your dad do? I would never tell anyone he was a, he was a cab driver because like they'd immediately know like, oh, he's definitely not a Rambo. Um, and so, yeah, then that almost like redeveloped myself, became Nabade again. 
um, and only really recently realized, uh, and because of conversations like these and because of the people on the panel, because of you guys, I realized it's okay to be in a bed. Uh, and I, I wonder like how many people are out there being a Rambo or a Rocky or whatever they want to try and be uh, because they can't be who they want to be. Um, and I think comes back to what James said, and I think it's a, it's a good place to start the conversation uh, around rep why representation matters. Is this, I didn't see anyone like me, so I couldn't be me. I had to be the next best version and couldn't be true to myself until these conversations happened, until these guys were around. Now I'm looking at this panel and I'm thinking, oh, there's quite a lot of us there. <laughs> um, so yeah, over, over to you guys. I'd love to hear your stories um, about why you believe representation matters. Um, I don't know who wants to take the mic, but you can go ahead. I'll go, and I just need to do a disclaimer. I'm double vaccinated and I've had a test. <laughs> just got a cough, and I feel like you need to I'm say that these days. The two. <laughs> <laughs> We've nailed this, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is what I expected. Um, so, yeah, so I promise I'm fine. Actually, I'm never fine, but that's a different story. Um, uh, listen, I identify with all of that. Um, you know, as, as a brown kid, in South Cambridgeshire with the parents that ran the local village shop that was in a larger body than most of the others. Um, we, you know, properly the only Browns in the village, and I mean that in every sense, in every village around us. That lower socioeconomic group than the rest of them, and just completely in love with sport, particularly sports at that time that were boys' sports, I, I sort of reveled in the difference. I had to because otherwise it was much much more unsafe, I think. You know, choosing to stand out because you didn't fit in means you get to define what people say about you. So instead of people saying, oh, she's the fat brown girl, I was able to say, you know what, she plays in front of the back four, she plays fly half, she plays wicked, you know, all of this stuff. I was able to decide the subtitle to my name because I didn't want people to choose their own because I didn't want it to be the other stuff that I felt was unsafe to be. I only have this narrative now, right? As a seven, eight-year-old, you don't have that narrative, and I can see it now. But my dream as a kid growing up was to be John Barnes. There's so many things wrong with that. <laughs> Not John Barnes in any way. I need to hasten to add, because I still adore the man. But, you know, I wanted to be a footballer, a professional footballer, um, and I'm a woman from a South Asian background. I'm not, um, you know, a, a man from the Caribbean. Um, but that, he was the only one I could see really in that time and that made a lot of sense to me and, and having then spent 20 years in the industry I've lost count of the number of times I've been the only person in the room <clears throat> of colour often the only woman because I w I've worked in sport but specifically I worked in football for a long time and I'll just tell you one story that I allowed to um, go under the carpet because it we weren't in an environment we're in today where I could challenge it, and I wasn't in a place where I could challenge it. Um, I went to present something to the FA Women's Council, and I was in, in the, this was, I, think, I think they were still in Soho Square then, and I went and sat in the room, and someone said, I, I'll have a tea and two coffees. And I said, so will I, and they didn't quite get it, and then I stood up to present to them um, 20 minutes later, and you know, I stood up and presented to a room of white men and some women about women's football. I mean, you know, it's not like that today, but it's not that far down the line either. So um, it is great to see more, but I'm sure we'll get into some of the detail, but more needs to be done because you can have us up here, but we still need to be included in a different way. And that's the human first environment that Jamie talks about. Yeah, um, just to pick up on something you said there, uh, and honestly, guys, feel free to jump in whenever. Uh, I only by chance, I'm sat kind of in the middle. Um, <laughs> we're all equal here. <laughs> James didn't tell me to say that. Um, I want to just touch on a point you said there about um, like when you're in them rooms and everybody in that room is not like you. And you, you, you said that, and I really, it really like sits with me because I think about this all the time. You couldn't say anything because you weren't in the position to say it. Isn't that such a big problem? Um, and something that we always talk about is do we need leaders that ca that are like us or does it need to start at the bottom because we, we've all been at the bottom we've all started at the bottom but like until you're in a position where you're actually allowed to say something nothing's going to happen both is the answer i think we can't wait but i think that we can get stuck in oh no it needs to happen by grassroots no it needs to happen at the top it's both but, but i wonder whether the world is changing really really quickly and sport is at the forefront Sport has always been a voice. We hear nonsense, sport shouldn't be politicised. Well, it's always been <coughs> at the centre of politics. 
from Jesse Owens to Muhammad Ali to the 68 Olympics, Tommy Smith. There's, there's never been a Nelson Mandela 99, 1995 Rugby World Cup. It's given a voice for society that we haven't seen elsewhere. And I wonder whether there's a courage thing here, that we just need to have the courage to speak up. Less about position, less about authority, less about whether you're at the top of the organization. If I look back, those of my vintage, you remember a time when no one was given the permission to speak up. Today we have a generation that only knows how to speak up and they speak out and they're embracing social justice and they do have a voice and you will be forced to listen. And I just wonder whether we all need to be that little bit more courageous, not wait to be invited, not wait for till I'm in the right position. It's I have a voice and I need to be heard. This is the definition of inclusion. No matter where I am, I have a voice. I deserve to be listened to. It deserves to be understood and valued. And we need to encourage all of us to speak up and speak out. I think I think it's a really interesting one around the, the representation. I would listen as a, as a white, Welsh, cisgender, non-disabled, straight person. I'm the definition of privilege, so I appreciate that. Um, but, uh, you know, I've met thousands of people over the years that have shared similar experiences to yourself and, and a lot more hor horrific stuff as well. But I think that the, the visibility of different people in society that are represented in our communities is so important when we talk about sport and even general industries. And I think that for far too long, and I think we've seen a bit more of a shift in the last 18 months, but for far too long, organizations are quick to change their logos to rainbow colors during Pride, um, which is great, you know, and we chose not to do that this year, which is quite an interesting one because I think what we're trying to do and what I think more organizations should try to do is not just turn up for Pride, or Black History Month, whatever it is, and right, we're done now and we'll see you next year. You know, it's trying to keep that conversation going, keeping that visibility going, and I think that's really important. Now, you know, football in Wales is still predominantly a white, um, male orientated sport, it's a lot of sports are, um, but there are people who are diverse within the game. But the trouble is, for too long, they haven't been seen. And what we're trying to do is, is to you know, give them that platform, that visibility, because they are massive role models. You know, it's, for me, it's not your, your Gareth Bales, for example. It's those people in the communities who, within their own community, could probably have a bigger impact than what Gareth Bale could go in within that. And I've got a good story to, to highlight why some of this is so important, to get people who are diverse talking about, not the fact that they're diverse, but talking about what, in a football context, what it means and the impact that it can have on them. And I, I met up with... Uh, uh, a transgender woman this week um, who for many years was living in the shadows for want of a better word and um, played football when, when they were younger um, because of some of the, the challenges the environment um, stopped playing uh, and and had seen all of the work that we've been doing um, with setting up the rainbow wall which is our LGBTQ supporters group some of the educational stuff some of the visibility stuff that we do in some of the videos where we've interviewed um, some LGBTQ people um, about their experiences of football with, with the, trying to shift the narrative around more of the positive stuff and focusing on you know homophobia the negative side of it um, and I kind of basically looking to, to obviously get them uh, registered and, and playing. And I just asked them a question, you know, why now? You know, wh what has kind of brought that about? And it was very much that, that they said, well, for so long I wanted to, but I was scared, I was nervous, was worried about it not being in a welcome environment, not being somewhere where I feel that I can belong. And I've seen all this stuff that you've been doing, some of the people talking about their positive experiences, and it gave me that confidence to to basically take that step forward and get in touch. Now, for me, talk about the impact that sport can have on, on people, on humans, on, on society, um, and some of that visibility, it just highlights that, you know, what it can have and, and change with people live. And, and I think for me, that's where more, and we got a long way to go, that's just one, one, one example, but I, I think that sport, society, needs to get to a point where we're going beyond that superficial looking like we're doing something and trying to make sure that we're creating that environment where people feel that they belong. You know, they're part of it and their sexuality, their ethnicity, their disability, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Uh, and that they feel that they belong the environment is conducive for them to be the best version of themselves. And that's what we're trying to create within, where we got a long way to go, don't get me wrong. We're, we're getting there slowly. Um, but for me, I think that is what we want to see, is real meaningful change and sustainable change. And I think that, that is where, uh, where a lot of industries are, are falling down at the moment.
point around like visibility and you can't be what you can't see and it's it's massively important i know we're going to talk more about kind of the media side of things but for me that leadership bit is is the impact on the everyday decision making of bodies in the in particularly in sport we've talked so much about diversity at board level which is brilliant we've just seen um the updated governance code been released from uk sport and sport england within the last month and for the first time that contains suggested targets around ethnic diversity and disability which is brilliant and they've pushed the targets forward around women's representation as well what we're not talking about is leadership level exec teams and that for me is the biggest elephant in the room in this sector in that those are the people that are sat around those top tables every day making big decisions, small decisions, decisions that have an impact on everybody's lives from staff to participants. Um, and there's there's no substitute for lived experience, right? There's, there's no excuse not to have that uh, diversity around the table. And until that's there, you cannot say that you're making fully informed decisions aware of the impact of, of what you're trying to do. Um, yeah, you're going to follow up? No, yeah, I was just going to say there, um, it kind of comes almost full circle to like the grassroots side of it. Because um, I'm also like very careful of saying, you know, because I'm an Asian guy that I should be on a board because like you need someone there. Um, because I, I also don't think that's the fix because then we'll end up going so far the other way and end up stuck in between. Um, do you think that if we try and, if, basically if we try and push it more in, at the grassroots level of, of any industry, we'll speed up the process in getting more people into them important boardrooms? Because as, as we've all mentioned, we've all, all been there. We've been in them rooms where like whatever you say doesn't really matter. It, it's fallen on deaf ears because they they're gonna make a decision anyway. But do it, does that start like here, so we don't just skip the queue? So we can learn from the gender debate, right? The gender debate. If we think about the thirty percent club, which was started seven years ago, and they started. They looked out at the FTSE two hundred and fifty, and they decided that they're gonna thirty percent of boards needed to be be female. They gave themselves a five-year target. No quotas, but to have targets, push, lobbying, really challenge the environment. It took them seven years to get to 30%. Because we're not talking about just appointing people. It's cultural change. For it to be sustainable, we're changing cultures. Cultures don't change overnight. And I would say that we need to understand that a heavy-duty lifting of culture takes time. As we sit here today, I'm not surprised about sports lack of representation on boards. There is not a black board director of a FTSE 100 business in the UK. There is not a black board director of a FTSE 250 business in the UK. So why should sport be so unique? But we've got to start somewhere and we've got to push and we've got to make this sustainable. But I would say, be a little bit more optimistic. Because if I think of what's happened in the last 18 months, it's more than I've seen in the last 20 years. And your generation is the generation. This is the generation that's going to make it happen. You're braver than we were. You're better informed than we, are. we were. You're better educated. You're not going to take no for an answer. You're more tenacious. You're more challenging. I, I'm supremely optimistic that you guys ain't going away. And you can't afford to. Because we are reliant on you to hammer home this change. But it ain't going to happen overnight. I think... Um I may belong to your generation because I feel quite jaded and, <laughs> and tired already. And, and I think, especially since George Floyd and, and the BLM movement, I found that to be quite a, an exhausting time where suddenly lots of people that were my friends had woken up to what's going on. And it was like, yeah, but I've been living this for, for 30 years. And I, and I was kind of guilty of being like, well, I'm not, inter <laughs> I'm not interested anymore for, for a little bit. Obviously, I, I have a passion for it. I always try to drive change by stealth, we were saying. So I, I run a YouTube channel that's quite big. We interview big big name footballers and bring YouTubers and create entertainment. And what I've tried to do by stealth is create positive representation of, of these players as human beings. But that's what, how I do it. But as far, far as, uh, yeah, the what happened over the last 18 months, I actually have been quite tired by it. And it was actually... A, point where I don't know if anyone else had this experience but I actually withdrew a little bit from those conversations because I thought oh is this gonna 
my experience told me, is this just going to be a flash in the pan? Is everyone going to get tired after a, a few weeks? And that might be a, a shame to say, and maybe I'll come out of the woodwork. But yeah, I feel a little bit jaded and, and fatigued by by the last 18 months rather than I had a bit more passion and drive when I felt like I was banging the drum and, and, and sort of hitting my head against the the wall, I yeah, I found it difficult this, this last 18 months. We were we were talking this morning, weren't we? And I and I feel I don't know, I feel that the environment's different since the last eighteen months. I think the one thing that the the Black Lives Matter has brought is that it's at the forefront of the of the masses, of everyone's sort of mind now and, and you know, being in uh, certain environments where you would never hear people talking about race or, you know, in a pub for example, and I I'm from uh Crefilly in, in uh in Wales, which is 99.8% white, Welsh generally. So, um, so, but I think the difference has been, particularly within sport, is that you know previously you you have instances that happen on the pitch. It's all over the new newspapers, the media for what, three days if we're lucky, and then it gets forgotten about until the next time happens. Now it does feel a different shift in the last 18 months where there has been, and, and quite possibly with the players taking the knee, it. it Hopefully, as, as made sure as the conversations are are, are continued. Um, but I think the key thing is, is that, and going back to the point you were making, it's not down to individuals like yourself um, to take on that burden. Might be a strong word, but I think we need more white role models. You know, and, and that's where I, I feel myself. I know I've got a role within it, but brings that in. Where I think the more people we come out as allies and people challenging it. Um, consistently every day within their space, um, I think the better, because everybody within their own cir social circles can have the biggest influence. And I think that's what is the key thing in relating it to football and sports. You know, it's great to see a lot more white footballers being a lot more vocal, um, you know, the likes of uh, Harry Kane, Declan Rice, etc. You know, so it's not just Raheem Sterling yeah. or Marcus Rashford constantly, <coughs> you know. Yeah, I think it's, it's very powerful having allies, because I think there's a sense of responsibility, even when Maybe my role's been a creative or a strategist on a on a brand campaign. I also feel because I've got that experience and that empathy that it's also I have a duty. And sometimes you're not there to do it. Sometimes you are. Sometimes you have the energy to push for for what's right in the communication. But sometimes you're not there. And it is so powerful when you know that someone who's got a bit more status in the room is, is on your side. And sometimes you can bring that out of them by by educating them or shining a light on it. But yeah, you have different days where you've got the energy for it. There's other days where you don't, and having those allies in the room is is really empowering and allows you to bring more of your knowledge and your experience and the texture of what you what you can bring and the value you can bring in those rooms when you have those allies in the room. So definitely agree with that. But both your points are really important. I get the jaded because you're doing that on your own, and you're having to answer questions on what's it really like, where's it really going, and why are you seem to be the person that needs to respond to it? So that's not fair, but I get the jaded. But I also take your point. It's a collective. And if we look at the room we look at, this is the way it should be. It's not any one of us. It's not any one race. It's all of us. It's a collective. And the embarrassment of the Euro 2020s brought the silent majority into play. Majority of people want it, but we've never spoke out as a collective. And it's been too easy to just be an innocent bystander. It's now no longer appropriate to say, well, I'm non-racist. You have to be anti-racist. There are no innocent bystanders. You can't be neutral. Because that's a political stance anyway. You're not doing anything. You've decided not to do anything. It's not good enough. And we need to call each other out. Because to your point, it's absolutely right. It won't be one race, it's never one gender, it's when everybody picks up the world we want to live in. I live just down the road in St John's Wood, and early last year we had some pretty awful anti-Semitic slogans just daubed on various shops and that. And our local MP, who Tulip, who's Tulip Sadiq, who's five foot nothing powerhouse, a um, Bangladeshi Muslim called everyone out. And we're going down to a local school to meet what we're going to do about it. Proudly, when we turned up, we're of every race, we're of every faith. We're a representation of multicultural London. We were all offended. We're all going to do something about it. And collectively, how powerful are we? It wasn't a Jewish issue, it's our issue. And I think we've got to start seeing this as the world we want to live in, it's our world. And we can't do it, you shouldn't have to stand up and take this fight on. Cheers. <laughs> but the, 
collective responsibility that we are so much stronger together. I was saying there's a really good example of that just to bring it to life where I've seen it start happening. I think where my optimism comes from. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, UK Sport and the four home nation sports councils at CEO level made a statement. And I saw the statement and I, I'm actually, I'm a huge fan of some of those CEOs. I'm not a huge fan of all of them. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll read the statement. I'll see what happens. And the statement was about two particular pieces of work they were going to do um, to inform themselves before they made a decision. Um, and the two pieces of work were a data piece, which I obviously just ignore, um, and then a lived experience piece from people who have um, been subject to, to racist abuse within sport at every level. So from grassroots seven-year-old through to elite athlete, through to someone on the board, through to someone working at mid-manager level. Um, and it was th that p particular piece of research was done by a black-led research agency called AKD. And we were asked to go in and, and look at those two pieces of research and just facilitate two conversations or three conversations between the five CEOs and then a set of directors. When I read the AKD research, I mean, I, I sobbed my way through it. And, I, and I, if I meet someone that hasn't sobbed their way through, I really don't want them anywhere near me, to be honest. So I, I urge you to read it. But what was interesting was how those CEOs came together and just recognized what they could do as a collective, where they were stronger together, where the whole was greater than the sum of the parts, but where each of them had to go and do their own work as individuals, as CEOs, as individuals, as directors, what they place into their organization as behavior change and what they're going to do about it. Because lots of people made statements back in, um, in June, but it was really interesting to, to see what's come out afterwards. All I did was ask a few questions and, and allow them to be humans first and do their work. They're the ones that have done this work. So two, two things really, read that research. If you really want to understand what the lived experience of people from um, ethnically diverse backgrounds in sport is, read that research, it's available publicly on their website. Um, but I think the interesting bit is that that collective we are collectively going to be anti-racist and do this means that my kid sister, who was arrested five years ago for Black Lives Matters being, you know, um, cemented to the floor on the on the on the M4 outside Heathrow, isn't the only one doing that. It's everyone in this room. It's me doing it, you know, in a suit, and she's doing it on the floor, and all of us here in our own way, and all of our shapes, sizes, and colours. So I think from an optimism perspective, particularly within sport, as someone who has been fairly um, Having worked in that sort of the arm's length body space of it, been a bit like, oh, nothing ever happens here, there's too much red tape. It was positive to see. I get to do it on this side, on the more corporate side, where there are a few, a little less red, red tape, still a little bit, maybe pink tape, I don't know. But it, you know, it's nice to see that there is optimism, so I do take that, Good. always. I think it's, uh, it also includes every other type of discrimination. Um, so right, it, obviously we're, we're speaking about uh, people being racially discriminated and how everybody needs to stand up. But also, um, I think as men, we're, we need to be more responsible for women as well. Um, I think like sometimes we go, oh, okay, I do this bit for racism. So like, ah, I've done like my little bit. I've done my one checkbox. And I think if you're going to be that, you want to be that person, uh, which isn't a particular type of person. You just want to be a good human. Um, you've got to be a good human for everyone. You can't just be a good human for Muslims and for Asian people, but not for Jewish and white people. You, you can't just like tick a box here and there and think you've done your bit because then you're just as bad as the next person who's like, yeah, I really want to see guys playing football, but I don't want to see a woman presenting it. But I, I do want to see the guys ha having a few black guys in there, a few, few Asian guys in there. I, that would be good, wouldn't it? Some of my best friends are, is the sentence, right? Um, that's the one we're bored of, is yeah. everything, right? I think I'd like to see a lot more that collaborative, join it approach. When we're talking about, so it's why I used to work for Show Racism the Ricard, which is a, a, an educational charity. And, and I see a lot of charitable organisations that are focused on a particular equality strand, kind of just focusing on their area and almost kind of like not worrying about everything else. And, and I appreciate that quite often it's down to funding and finances that they're fighting for altogether. But I think that if we can get to a point, and this is within, within sport governing bodies, but everyone looking at that intersectionality and looking at the impact on that. And I think it's something that I appreciate has come a little bit of a buzzword in, in recent times, but I think really deeply understanding that and the, and the impact of that. But I think pooling resources together, particularly in the third sector and charities, because ultimately the principles cut across, irrespective of whatever it is. Um, and I think that's an approach that 
I think I'd like to see more of is, is charities and an organisation working together because ultimately it's all towards the same goal about creating that inclusive environment where everyone can be the best version of themselves. Yeah, I, yeah there's so much I could unpick around that <laughs> AKD work and what was happening around that leadership space having spent 10 years or so working in traditional sport, being at Sport England at the top of that kind of governance tree and seeing some of this stuff unfold. Um, uh, I'm just trying to... Don't, just say it. Uh, the reason why I, I set up my own business was to move away from that space, was to get away from the politics, from the bureaucracy, from the red tape, from the fact that it's been a year since that research started and we're still yet to see any firm commitment whatsoever from any of those governing bodies about what they're going to do about it. Um, and it's an amazing piece of work. I was involved with it uh, uh, from a board level on the board of the Black Swimming Association. Um, I was at Sporting when this work started and um, I, I just want to see the action. And it's uh, there's a real point for me about how like the genuineness behind the leadership, particularly around some of this stuff. And it's a, it, we've tried to unpick some of this over the last couple of days. And this, this balance point of why this work is being done, who it's being led by, and who is influencing that kind of decision making. And I just wanted to come back to that kind of what, Christian, you were talking about around not wanting to be in that space. And I saw a lot of people going through Black Lives Matter, but also being asked about generating solutions and were being targeted to come up with the ideas about how we make things better. Um, and there's, there's so much within that about how we kind of get that right. And progress is brilliant, it's progress, right? But at the expense of what and it, at the expense of who? Um, and we've talked a lot about what we might see publicly and progress that's being made. And But having been on the other side of it and seeing what that's kind of like and um, seeing what people go through, it's that bit behind it that it is it really sits uncomfortably with me because we know what kind of happens behind the scenes in, in a lot of this stuff. Um, but it's so hard to get that balance right publicly when you're making progress, but at the extent of what? I think it links to, to Renee's point about courage. So when everything kicked off, I you know, typically got asked, will you be on our D&I group at work? And I said, no. So I was like, it's your fucking mess. You fix it. You know, it's not, it's not my mess. Um, you know, me going in and, and saying stuff isn't helpful. Um, but me challenging back and I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it had the environment not changed. I wouldn't have been brave enough. If, had I not done my own work as well um, and c combated my own like racism that I'd been brought up with without even realising it. But sort of s being able to say no to stuff like that um, forces the work where it's needed. But I also think that we need... It's, a, it's the word belonging. We've used it a couple of times and maybe I just... For me, there is a significant difference between belonging and fitting in. Fitting in is you moulding yourself to a shape that has been created for you externally. Belonging is you showing up as yourself human first, right? That brings us all the way back to someone like Naomi Osaka, who's putting herself first, Simone Biles putting herself first, doing that work on yourself, understanding, you know, taking a neuroscience approach to it. You know, what's, what's instinctively in the back of my brain? How do I add some actual theory into it? And how do I add emotion into it in the middle to say, I'm going to make a wise decision that puts me first so I can be the best I can be. But that's, that div that's where intersectionality comes into it because we, there's still discrimination if you have mental health challenges. There's still discrimination if you're a woman, if you're in a larger body. Having been... Um, Every size from six to 24, I can tell you that thin privilege exists. And, and I think that there are things about people saying it. Like, that's not something I have ever really talked about a lot. But I think there's the courage bit about saying it and saying, but also I'm not going to find the solutions because it's not my problem, you know? And I think as well, that, and it's something we're, we're trying to do, I think I want to see more clubs, governing bodies of sport, organisations actually being more open, transparent, honest. And, and you know, being honest about where they're at with with regards to the the demographics of their staff, you know, we we see a lot of reports, but it's it's hidden, it's not quite clear, or it's not even even public. Um, but also, kind of, 
being being vulnerable and being comfortable with being vulnerable and, and kind of, you know, being very clear that look, this is where we're at. You know, there's one thing kind of coming in that, that I've I've tried to, to for us to do is to kind of go, look, you know, we, we haven't done enough, you know, but we're at a point where this is what we're going to do. These are what we feel the solutions are moving forward to improve the environment, the game, and, and everything around that. Um, and I don't see enough organisations doing that. And we, we were speaking earlier, Randy, when we were about boards, and you know, it's, it's quite ironic at the moment that there's, I sense, and there's a real fear of, of white men on boards or in senior executive positions that they're going to be dethroned. You know, and it's almost the first time in their life they're feeling oppressed, which is quite ironic. Um, but but for me, I think it, it's it's important. We were talking earlier about. A, uh, you know, a quote or a rule style thing for boards, and um, I, I, I haven't got the answer for that, I'm not quite sure, but I, I think the danger is if you start removing people and replacing them, even if they are fully qualified, you know, and there's plenty of people out there, of course, that can, that can sit on boards, etc. The trouble is then you, you're going to lose people, and, and I think it'll take longer to, to, to come about that cultural shift is what, what we need, certainly within, within sports. But I think actually it's trying to, and, and that's with some education, training, having those open conversations, honest conversations in that safe environment where nobody feels judged um, and nobody has to apologise for their own lack of understanding, but trying to bring people along with us because we need those white middle-aged men um, because ultimately they're in the positions of power at the moment. So I think trying to bring them along with the journey and, and part of that cultural change will only be better than, than going the opposite, which I think will co cause it to be longer and cause friction. I'd, I'd love to hear some of your experience as people that deliver this work of of reaching those people that are harder, that are harder to reach. I feel I am by no means an expert on LGBTQ rights. I'm by no means an expert as I am constantly corrected rightfully by my girlfriend on anything with, with gender. I just put my foot in it all the time. Um, but I feel that because I've had an experience as a mixed race person with an ambiguous look, so I get quite an eclectic range of <laughs> racist abuse and racial experiences depending on whether I've twisted my hair, grown it out straight, and, and I've had quite a unique experience in that sense of, of being identified in different ways. So I feel like I am naturally predisposed to being a bit more empathetic with the idea that maybe I don't know everything because I've had a variety of experiences. I think with, with people that haven't had that, I feel that there's a, a fear of an admission of guilt, um, and I, I'm very interested in, in how you guys go about reaching th those people that are maybe a bit a bit less receptive to, to going, oh, I've got it wrong. <laughs> so, so we find, and we're, our experiences are coloured by, we, we focus on big businesses, right? really big businesses. The only sport governing body we've had an experience with, and it's an awful one, was Motorsport UK. I'll come back to that later. <laughs> but um, what, what we find in big business, and, and they're all similar, and, and for some obscure reason, being in, an ex in the extremes ne never helps change. And we've got a government, like them or loathe them, who've adopted quite an extreme position when it comes to culture, the culture wars, race. Nearly ev every minority is facing an issue. And it's forced a lot of well-intentioned organizations, the opposition, to take an extreme position on the other side, academia, public sector, etc. What's left in the middle, which shocks me, is big business. And they're doing stuff. Believe me, they're doing stuff. It's clumsy, it's clunky, but it's well-intentioned and we're working with them. And I just wanted to your point about what do you do? Our, one of our biggest challenges is preventing them from rushing to action because they so don't want to be accused of some of the things saying, we're tick boxing, you're just whitewashing, you don't really mean it. So they rush to meaningless action. So they do the numbers, the KPIs, the data gathering, but hearts and minds haven't shifted. The entry level still look up and they don't see anyone like them. The younger generation is getting really frustrated because they don't see the change. And what we've realized is you never realize the power of inclusion until you've been excluded. And far too many of us can't remember when we are excluded. And some of us, it's an everyday occurrence. So we try and create an environment where everyone in the room can feel excluded because it's so powerful and unforgettable when you've experienced it. Yesterday, we did the top 250 of Nando's, right, 17,000 person organization in the UK. And they've got exactly the same problem that nearly every business we work worked with. Entry level looks really diverse. You go to restaurants and the teams look really diverse that were there. You go to the restaurant manager, hmm. 
You go to the management above that, you go to middle man, it's all white, middle class, quintessentially British. And when you get to the top 250 we dealt with, two people of colour. So we did an exercise. They're on 12 tables, 10 on, 10 on the table, and I just asked them a very simple question. Can two of you, on each table, talk about a time when you were excluded? Okay, and what happens, and, and I'm going to choose someone, anyone on the table, to explain how did it feel listening to those two. Right, so any two. And the majority is women who are being excluded, sharing what they've done. And the tears in the room, the power of the stories, because it's so close, and many of them were experienced within Nando's. That makes it even more powerful. It's inappropriate behavior from us that made you feel excluded. And for many of the white middle-class men who don't feel excluded often, it was so powerful. And when I was getting them, choosing people on the table to talk through how did it feel, voices breaking, could hardly pull themselves together. It's the power of being excluded. And sometimes knowing I was the one that excluded you. I was part of the people that excluded you. And once you get to that shared experience and you have the courage to talk about it, the needle starts to really move. Because you're starting now to recognize when you're excluding, but sometimes inadvertently, sometimes quite thoughtfully. And, but until you start to share some of those experiences, I don't think the actions are really meaningful. Until you've taken the hearts and minds, I actually know what it's like for a while to walk in your shoes. Can I sit down and listen to you in a way that I'm feeling what you're feeling? Can I come and spend some time with you? We do the reverse mentoring, the reverse advocacy, the reverse sponsoring. So senior executives are walking the shoes of someone else. So powerful. And we always find that the more senior person takes much more learning than the more junior person. But it starts to shift the cultural dial. Because what you really want is we can agree things together. We're finishing off each other's sentences. So we had a story that came out from Unite Students, chief executive. It wasn't getting through to the top team. And he said, I was sitting on the top of a bus with my two kids, and there was a black woman who was being abused by four louts, and the bus was quite full. No one said a word. It got uglier, nastier, and more racist. No one said a word. It's a regular occurrence. His seven-year-old daughter pulled away from him, ran over to the louts and asked them to stop abusing her and said, this is wrong. You can't use that language. Leave her alone. In seconds, the whole bus spoke up because the seven-year-old spoke up. Now, the lesson is for all of us, what would you do in that situation? When I asked the room, most of them said, if I was on that bus, I'm not sure I would have spoken up. Honest. That's what we're trying to break through. It's not easy. But if we can have the level, those levels of conversations openly, we start to get somewhere. Do you feel as though, like the example you've given is of a seven-year-old kid where when, when everyone's been that young, you're not afraid of anything? So you kind of go like, I can say this because nobody knows me on this bus and I'm not going to get judged at school. Do you feel as though people in media, uh, in particular social media, people with big accounts or professional footballers or a person of any sort of influence, we need them people to own, almost own up to their personal vulnerabilities around these topics. And that way it almost like creates this, um, how, how would I put this? Almost, um, almost allows people in other sectors, in other positions of power to go, actually Manchester United's captain has just said, he, he recognizes the fact that at some point in his life, he's not really understood what someone of a different um, ethnic background or whatever is going through. And then all of a sudden you have, I don't know, the chief exec of Starbucks. I don't know his opinion, by the way. He might not have his opinion. But him to go, actually, I, I can now do that as well. I think, yes. We all, the more we, but it's not just those with the big accounts. It's all of us. We all have a voice. And I think that obviously there are some influence, obviously there's some leaders, obviously, but on this, in this particular area, every one of us can be a leader. 
yeah, I was going to make a point about um, like how we are doing EDI at the moment and that it's ultimately flawed in that we put it on individual people to do this work and lead this roles. And we've seen a massive leap over the last 18 months or so of this like massive expanse of EDI and i roles coming into organizations, heads of big like director roles. But it's flawed because you put it on one person. The way or what I'm trying to do with inclusive cultures now is to is to really come back to embedding it in the fabric of organizations. We are late to the party with this stuff. We are catching up. We are trying to undo all the history that we know about to try and make things equal. Um, and the only way that we're going to be successful with that to stop this kind of scrabbling for the next day to celebrate, the next history month, the next media explosion of something that happens is to properly embed it in what we're all doing. So using things like performance management, building in values, proper business management tools, having a representative leadership team, having staff networks, all of that stuff that creates a space where people can be themselves and naturally just share what they feel and be themselves will create this healthy environment where we don't have conversations about what are we doing for this event or that month or the training that uh, kind of we need to keep rolling out and just creating that inclusive culture. Um, we've talked a lot about how um, like how there's there's so much split kind of training education in this space to try and inform people about privilege, about unconscious bias, about EDI legislation or what you can and can't do around discrimination. But actually, I think somebody said already, it's it's about being a nice person, right? It's about not being a dick. That's what we're trying to do with this with this kind of work. Um, and so much of that comes from creating that space where people can just genuinely be them and everybody benefits from that. There's no downside to it. I think um, I got quite a unique job and role really whereby if I'm successful I do myself out of a job because I'm not needed anymore um, which I always joke about but yeah I, I, I think that's really important it's certainly something I'm trying to do because you're right I, I can't take on everything else everything myself um, but I, I think it needs to be embedded across any organisation so because it's everyone's role everyone can play a key part in that because I'm not going to be in every meeting and every um, you know, decision etc um, and, and I think that that is really key so if organisations have a role like myself which, which I do think is important because I think there's always a place for that but um, in terms of the real expertise but everyone has to have it at the forefront in their mind and, and you know I've seen a, a shift I've only been in it just over a year but we're hearing people talking about this at around you know in the kitchen while well, making a coffee you know that weren't happening before and and i think that's where we need to continue to to get on where if your organization is not as diverse and, and ours isn't by the way you know we're, we're working on that but for those then that are privileged um that they at least can shift their mindset and try and see it through um somebody else's lens um and they might not fully understand the experiences but at the very least can try and see um, how a decision might impact on different people, and I think that's you know that in that first phase is 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 important to to try and get to that. And I think on it. I think just to go back to your point, debate about influential people in the media holding their hands up. There was a really good example. I don't know if you remember Gary Neville coming out and on Monday Night Football and talking about how he had maybe just not seen things, turned a blind eye, and not been good enough. And you could really tell that he'd, or at least it came across as if he'd really thought about it, digested it, taken responsibility, but wasn't crucifying himself. And I think it was like a really good example of not being overly guilty about it, but actually just recognising that he hadn't done enough and that he wanted to do more. But the catalyst of that was Raheem Sterling coming out and doing the unthinkable and actually putting it to the media, the the, the narrative makers, the powerful guys that tell tell the stories and point out their their in discrepancies. So you can see that it's always that blend, isn't it, from, from people with small accounts to people that maybe don't realise the power they have to someone like Gary Neville. And I think he was just a really good example of someone with a lot of influence, that has a lot of clout, that has a lot of respect with people with lots of different opinions and values and interest in that subject to actually be able to go, hey, I didn't do enough, 
but I'm not killing myself over <laughs> over the idea that I didn't, but I'm going to do more and it's serious. And I thought I thought that was a really powerful moment and I'd love to see more of that because I think it, it sets precedent, doesn't it? I think he's, since then he's also come out and spoke about transgender athletes. Um, during the Olympics, I think he tweet, tweeted some stuff, basic, basically pretty much admitting that he doesn't have a clue about how to deal with this stuff. Um, and the question that sprung to my mind is like, are, are we are we just not ready or were we just not prepared? Like when, when all of this stuff happened, it suddenly went, Oh my God, like these guys exist as well. Or these people exist as well. And how do they exist? But that, that surely on like everyone to kind of be like, hold on, how are we, how are we not ready for this? It's Cause we're late. Yeah. It's because it's always been one way and everyone else has missed out. And that's what we're trying to undo in sport, in every sector, in politics. I mean, yeah, it, I always use the example at the moment that supposedly this is the most diverse cabinet there's ever been in politics, and yet we know their position on racism, inclusion, immigration, etc. Um, but that point that that these kind of minority groups are the minority because of the the structural situation, but this links into that kind of wider point about intersectionality that we've kind of touched on in that it can be so overwhelming in this space because there's disability, there's there's women's rights, there's trans equality, there's an endless list of people that need to be included, that need to have their voices heard um, because of the situation we're in and that we're constantly trying to play catch up to um, to make sure that those voices are, are heard. I think specifically on, on transgender in sports, I think we've got caught up at the performance end of it because the majority of people that want to play sport just want to play sport. You know, it's the small percentage that make it, and I'm not in that percentage. Um, but that shouldn't mean that I couldn't participate. And I think we've got caught up in the transgender conversation at Olympic level, at, and the people that lose out is 99% of the rest. Because that argument, oh, well, you're... And, and the science that people are throwing out, the sort of pseudoscience that people are throwing out about it, that this is going to give you... I cannot imagine, and I don't know this, but I cannot imagine that someone that wants to, to, um, to transition is putting themselves through that emotionally, physically, psychologically, spiritually to win a gold medal because it just isn't that important. And having worked with many gold medalists, the medal isn't the important bit for them, it's the journey. No one's going to take on that journey for a gold medal. They're going to take it on because it's going to make their lives better and so they can be who they want to be. So the narrative of transgender in sport being placed at a performance level devalues the opportunity for everyone else. And I think sometimes, and I'm not saying that there, there isn't huge value in having representation at the top, seeing someone like Charlie Martin um, as an incredible race driver and everything that, that she's faced, seeing someone like Chris Mosier and everything that he's done, or they've done actually, I think is his pronoun, um, their pronoun, well done Rods. Um, and I make mistakes as well and I get it wrong and, and you know, it's just learning. Um, so I think that we need to ensure that at a participation level we put that first because there is no peak of the pyramid without it. Yeah, so again, this is a real close topic for me. I've led on transgender inclusion in sport for 10 years or so in the sector for different organizations. And I think you're totally right. There is a massive distinction between grassroots participation, elite level sport. Um, but the bit I always come back to, which you kind of touched on is that th th this is a real person, right? That we're talking about. These are real people wanting to take part in sport, to have access to the thing that we all love and have, have had experiences from. Um, the performance side of it is is tricky and if we want to go down that route of using science, let's really use all the science to create as close a level playing field as we possibly can, although I despise the term a level playing field because it just doesn't exist and it shouldn't because everybody's going to need different levels of support at different times. But the bit that I'm starting to see now, particularly in the UK, around that level, and it has an impact on other areas of kind of inclusion, is where the UK sport governing bodies, or majority of them, are trying to be more inclusive around transgender inclusion in sport than what is coming down from an international level because they want to do the right thing. They want to be inclusive. And we're just starting to get to that point now where some organisations are saying, all right, this, this is maybe a risk for us as an organization. We are 
by coming out and saying we want to be trans inclusive, there is a risk that we may lose some female participants because of all the discussions around it. And we're just about starting to touch on this point where organizations are being braver to say, I'm all right with that because I don't want those people playing in my sport if we want to include other people. If we're including people, that should not be at the expense of others unless they don't want to be at that in that same space. I think you saw that with Ben Me, you know. You're not our fans. Don't say that stuff. We don't want you in our stands. You know, that's really strong leadership and I completely agree with that. And massive, particularly around women's sport, because sport has taken so long to get to that point. So to be to take a calculated risk to say we might lose some of these participants is huge. But that's when we really start to see leadership and progression in that space. You know what the sorry? No, I, I just a little bit of left field on this mind, but uh, I think I think it's interesting looking at sport as being binary in the first instance, which is a the whole discussion. So I'll just touch on this briefly. But for example, in football, once beyond sixteen, you either play women's football, or you play men's football, and it's interesting that in the in the Netherlands they've um, doing some really interesting stuff where they're increasing the age. I, th I think it now is under 19s that you can continue playing mixed football, um, and, and I know there's plans in, in extending that further as well. Um, and and it's an interesting one that. You know, within Wales, we don't have provision for adult mixed football that, that's regulated, not your tournament play sort of stuff, you know. And, and that's another interesting discussion itself, you know. Should should there be a provision that those, and I'm not saying it's a full solution, but it would provide an opportunity until we catch up with, with some of these issues with around transgender athlete yeah, players? Yeah, and we get so, I mean, I spent five years or so working in sport talking about toilets like it, it's it was just endless we get so focused on what people are doing in bathrooms as one example in this space and we get so worried about where people are going to go what options are available who's going to go where the simple answer is to provide something for everyone and that's what we're trying to do to make sure that everybody get access um, in whichever way they want to and that comes down to which toilet they want to use which session they want to go to in the week which way they want to learn a new skill, whatever it is, people should be empowered to do it the way that they want to do it. Um, and that's what it all comes down to for me. Uh, I was just going to say on that point, it just reminded me of something. Um, it's so interesting you say that and we all go, you know, yeah, yeah, that's definitely right. Me being uh, a brown, straight male, I didn't like getting changed in the guys' change room at football. And that was nothing to do with like, anybody else just me it was myself like I, I didn't want to jump in the shower with a bunch of guys because like I just didn't want to do it um but that wasn't to do with how anybody else was acting that was just my own personal thing I like I like my own cubicle I like my own environment um but like the club would still be like like our manager would always say you you got to get in the shower um and it, he's I don't know why he did it like this um but he'd be like the defenders all get in the shower at the same time the midfielders and I was like <laughs> I was like, I want to be on the bench so I don't have to get in the shower. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's nuts because like, even, even to that point, like, it, we need to provide for everyone in that sense. Um, and it's not that difficult. Like, just whack us in a cubicle. Like, put a shower curtain up. Yeah, put, a put a divider. Like, up, yeah. You can do this stuff. You can make this stuff practical so easily without causing offence to anyone. And even on that specific point, like, how many other men in this country would have suffered from being in that situation? We've talked to all, a lot more recently about kind of men's mental health and there's so much within that to unpick, but just being forced to be in that situation, whether you're younger or older, whatever, like it's, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, um, I actually posted a little little bit about my experience on social media, which is almost like it's the beauty of social media where you can put something out and all of a sudden you go, oh my God, like, wait, we shared a change room together and I never knew you were thinking the same thing. Why did you get in the shower? <laughs> um, but like, that's the beauty of social media and how much power you get from it because you can say whatever you like and there will be people out there who are like-minded. Uh, and coming back to the Ben Me thing, it was really interesting to see him say that on Sky Sports on a televised game, knowing he would have known it was going to go viral because he was one of the first people to post about it. But I think that power that social media has given people and especially young people, um, coming back to your point of like, this will be the generation because this generation can just go, you know what, Ben Mee's absolutely spot on and I'm going to share this across my 300 followers and then another 300 people among their 300 followers. And social media suddenly can just create this avalanche where Sky actually commented after, um, so after a different debate, actually, I think um, the presenter whose name, I can't remember, uh, he's a great presenter, but 
Um, I think Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher were having a conversation about something and he cut Gary Neville off and said, we're just going to go for a break as they were speaking about racism. Um, and when they came back, someone had obviously told him in his ear, this has gone viral on social media in the last four minutes. And he said, look, I'm really sorry. We had to go for an ad break to explain uh, the situation. And then they, they almost like carried on with the debate. I would That would have never happened if social media didn't exist. <laughs> well, absolutely. But then the other side of it is the anonymity. It gives the silent majority who are not so silent behind their keypads. And there was, I think it was in the press yesterday about the number, the, the very small number of people that have had criminal charges placed against them for the, for the criminal activity that they delivered post the Euros. I didn't look at my phone after that match because I just knew what I was going to see. And I hate the fact that that's how I felt. Um, but I love the fact that there is this other side. It's just with a, with a, a government that purports to be equitable but doesn't, regulate and, and allows for it so i think that there is this is where that individual responsibility comes along to that everyone says and this is where a, d a democracy should work right um but obviously you know that does take an engaged community so i do feel like there's stuff to come but the the beauty of social media is all and the same with everything right everything's got a, a pleasure and a pain point to a certain extent um but i do think that the as much as we use social media for good, we, there needs to be, an, in the same way we're talking about active allyship, there needs to be an active change because people will only stop what they're doing when the consequences are consequences that hurt them. Closing down someone's account is not a consequence that hurts anyone. You just open up another account. So it's sort of finding, you know, same as me. Like if I'm, something doesn't hurt me enough, I'm not going to change it. You know, if I'm not upset about something enough, I'm not going to do anything about it. And that's in a good way and a bad way. So it's something to, to balance out because I love the fact that you, you're able to share something vulnerable on social media. Someone else identifies with you. Suddenly there's a little bit of healing that happens at a human level and that extrapolates out. It's basically the theory of 12-step programs, right? Is that personal identification for change um, and, and feeling as though you're part of and don't have to change that part so we come back to belonging. Just, sorry. We, we put out a few posts on LinkedIn around the Euro 2020s around race inclusion and quite edgy stuff. And a debate took place on our forums, which was out of our control. But because of the nature of LinkedIn, you have to declare who you are. And you have to, and many of them declare the company you work for. It got a little tasty. And we got the chief people officer of a financial services business came directly to me and said, look, a member of our team has come to me to apologize and said, he got carried away, said some things shouldn't have said, and has apologized and pulled out of the debate. But I'm asking you, were they racist? Because the, they've been deleted. Now, my team, noticing that this was getting really out of order, took screenshots. So I went back and read through them. They weren't pleasant. They were inappropriate, but they weren't racist. So I went back to him and I said, um, it's, he was right to apologize. He was right to delete it, but they weren't racist. And she went onto the site and she apologized to everyone, said that he was a member of their team. It's not what they approve of as a business. And he's apologized as well. Now that's... To me, that's the perfect ending, the perfect intervention, a level of ownership. But you can't do that on generic social media because of the anonymity. But we sh must get there. We must get there. And, I, and I'm not sure I buy the fact that it's difficult, it's complicated, all that rubbish. We've just got to get there. What would you say needs to change? On social, or oh, every, everything, just rip, rip it down. I, so I, I run a big... YouTube channel. We've we've grown it over the last twelve months and and work with some smart guys that know how to do this. What well, one of the things that you have to do, and, and you know this as as well as me, if not better, mate, is you have to play by the algorithm's rules. The algorithm loves controversy. Controversy gets clicks. We've tried to build a, a positive platform. It's harder. You don't get as much reach. You don't get as much engagement. It's been really nice to see the amount of eyeballs we've driven, the amount of followers, and the the community that we've we've created with with the latest platform that we've run, but you're you're going against that. I think the the things that need to change are 
a lot of those publishers it's a, a bit wild west it's not the most professional place we haven't got the systems and structures often you're under resourced so if you can get that support from the social media companies taking more responsibility to then bring you in and educate you as to how to run those communities how to flag things what you're what you're looking for that's a that's a great place to start but i think the algorithm the the reality of it is the controversy gets clicks is that kids are out there trolling to get likes on <laughs> on comments there's a game being played there and and if you're not playing playing it you're it's very very difficult to be relevant on those platforms the 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 second thing around the anonymity which you brought up is really complicated and i think that's um, where say from from glitch which is a brilliant charity around sort of online abuse and and protecting people actually defends the idea of anonymity and the the great things that come from that so it's quite a complex uh subject isn't it of course you you logically think people having their name and and being identified is, is the way to go but equally there are some really positive things and some really important things that come from protecting your identity so naturally everything just goes back to the the companies that really hold the data not the not the youtube channels that are just trying to work within within google's system not the twitter pages that are just trying to play the get play the game but those companies that really hold that data and, and what they decide to do and i don't know it does feel instinctively like it could be easy because the minute you put up three seconds of a music video that's got copyright on it it's that da it's down there's sophisticated technology in place to to get rid of things that they want to get rid of so it feels like they can do it the the, the question is what why then well, they're not, but it's... There. There'll be a few there's losses, but it's worth yeah. it. We can always find the reason why not, but we've got to find the reason to do it. I think the key thing is, so I've had a number of meetings with Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, particularly since March, where two of our players got abused on, on Instagram. And it's been really interesting to see the behind-the-scenes stuff, that some of the challenges that they have um, in, in trying to address this um, and, and some of the solutions they're putting in place, some things that they're coming. And I think there's been better developments in, in recent times. The trouble with machine learning with certain things and I met up with a company recently that's got this system that can find out these anonymous people and like where they live, everything, really, really amazing stuff, which hopefully will help. Um, but people who are abusive are constantly evolving. So, you know, there were certain words, um, the N word pick an example where the machine learning can pick up and it can flag up and, and hopefully stop it from being prevented. But then what do they do? They went to emojis. You know, now they've gone from emojis to using hashtags in terms of anti-Semitic stuff, in terms of train tracks of Auschwitz, etc. So it's constantly evolving. So it's, it's kind of trying to stay ahead of the curve a little bit. That now I'd like to shift the discussion a little bit around this. Now, yes, social media companies got a responsibility in terms of the content on their platforms, um, and and you know hopefully we'll continue to try and help that because you know they said to me themselves it's bad for business because it, they're losing people from their platforms because of the environment that is on there. Now for me, social media is very much a platform it's a it's a, it's a way that people can share and hear their views and attitudes the problem is society the problem is attitudes and people in society same with football and sport you know of course we have responsibility for that but ultimately until society shifts with some of these things we're going to continue to see it happening within sport and on social media so i think that is where the conversation needs to be focused on you know is it yes it's education with our young people that will take a bit of time and and by all means i although i used to think this but being older is not an excuse for me it doesn't kind of uh, you know give you that pass to uh, to have certain attitudes but for me i think that's where the, the focus need to be because until we solve that we're always going to see issues on social media or within sport the yeah we've spoken a little bit around how i think football particularly has it so hard because when you talk about football you talk about the population it's the world's game it's the country's game it's it's so hard to how do you drive change in that how do you change a nation around um some of this stuff and we've touched a little bit on the euros but i remember distinctly at just after the game finished the penalties finished I saw something that went viral that was like a mum, somebody took a screenshot of a text of a mum saying, get out now, get home, stuff's gonna happen, just get out. Um, the the ability that a few guys miss kicking a, like a blown up ball, the impact that that has on people's lives, I just find so overwhelmingly scary and and how that, 
how you start to drive change in that space. And I think the one thing that's really made a difference recently is where teams and coaches are walking off pitches. That seems to be the bit where things are starting to hit home. The teams themselves are saying, I'm not doing this. It's my workplace. I don't want to be in this space. It's about me personally. I don't want to be here. I want to stick up for my teammate. I don't want us to be in that position. And that's the only way I can see more of that change coming is if, if more teams in this country particularly just stop. You just take the game away. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about how that change can come. So it's, I don't disagree that it's a societal issue, but sport doesn't exist in a vacuum, as, as Rene said, right? So we have levers within sport, and it's incumbent upon us to use them. The first one is sport in and of itself, right? How do we modify the actual intentional use of sport on the ground to educate, to create change, to create environments of inclusivity, um, to teach, um, to give people experiences of the other with the other, um, and to experience that on, on the field of play. You know, we intentionally shift and adapt and design sport to be delivered in different ways around the world for change. So it's sort of one lever. The other lever is the platform of sport and the athletes in and of itself. And then the third one is us as an organization where we, as organizations, are we walking the walk as much as talking the talk? So absolutely it's a societal issue, but we are part of that society. We need to pull on those levers a little harder and we don't have to choose which lever. It was, that, it was the same, exa same thing around, we talked about gender equality and learning from that. We spent a long time going around this, the argument of broadcast versus um, sponsorship involvement and which one should come first. The stupid chicken and egg argument is you don't need to do either of them um, one at a time. You do both of them immediately. And that's true of all three levers. We don't have to make a choice. We just do them all. And that's really where the intersection of sport and society can come together, in my opinion. I 100% think that I've spent my life in this, so I would be wrong if I didn't, but I think the sport can be and is such a powerful tool to enforce and bring about social change. Um, but it's kind of, I think it's, for me, I maybe don't see enough being done in society. And, and it's great if sport is the, the sort of industry leading the way. Um, but and, and I think it certainly can can impact on people. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have spent my whole life doing it. But but I, I, th I think that, it, it, as you said, he needs that collaborative approach in, in all different industries and, and ways as well. I'll share with you my Motorsport UK experience now. <laughs> because we underestimated just how businesses, especially big businesses, are built for change. They're designed for change. And they're designed for big cultural change. Digitization. They'll do it. It won't happen overnight, but they're built for it. They've got the structures. They've got the hierarchies. They've got everything in place to do it. It just takes a bit of time, but they do it. When we got to Motorsport UK, after the Hamilton Commission, they had every reason to change, every reason we could think of. But the governance structures don't exist. They, they keep telling us they've got 170,000 people involved in Motorsport UK. They have some influence, but they don't have governance. They can't mandate it. And there was a complete lack of ownership, I felt. And they're used to a complete, and they get away with a complete lack of ownership. And the big issues don't get, but the clock keeps on ticking. We keep walking away thinking, I had enough of that. That's not going to And they keep coming back because they're being forced to, being forced to, being forced to. But to implement that cultural change all the way through is going to be challenging because they're not used to that. Regulations, yes, but deep cultural change, they don't have the appropriate structures, the way they can split the organization, hold people to account, the performance management you talk about, the communication sides, the checking, the monitoring, all the stuff that companies would do like that. You know, the, the, a big change comes in to a company, the pandemic. They're going to sort it. They just, no one's going to work from the office anymore. Bang, they just, it just works. They're used to doing it. When we're looking at some of the governing bodies, they, they need such change because what they've always done is no longer appropriate in a fast-moving, fast-changing fast world where they need to be held account. And I just don't feel that. Yeah, I think the bit that I see in that space is, um, again, like what we touched on a little bit, is like the shutters come down. Yes. Where you see any kind of challenge or to an organisation or to a leadership team or we see it 
we're talking about privilege a lot. The shutters come down immediately and it's like straight on the defensive instead of this change that we've seen in a few places about um, this openness, this honesty, this this willingness to have a discussion, this getting over this kind of white guilt thing, recognising the fact that you've got it is so powerful because it then means you can have the discussion about how others can get access to it or even how you can use your advantage to help other people experience the same things as you. But until we get past this, this shutters coming down, this is not an accusational point at single people about what they're doing because there's thousands of years of history to undo. It's not your fault we're in this situation. Let's talk about how we can get over it. Yeah, I, I think that Nick goes back to, to answer the question that you had earlier. It's, it's about the, the environment again. So are we creating that environment where people feel that they can be candid with each other? Um, and I think that we, we have to ensure that people challenge um, when, you know, when they hear something that's inappropriate, etc. Um, more than often, often it's people, there's no intention behind it, it's in sort of really explicit, overt um, intention. Uh, and, but I think it's how you challenge that and how you approach it is really important and go back to kind of how we do with education and various things so that you don't get that shut down because I'd say 100% of the time, you know, certainly in, t in terms of the education sessions I've run over the years is that when you challenge somebody that might have a certain attitude or say something straight away, they oh, I, I didn't mean that, they, they go on the massive offensive and it's trying to approach it that we're not judging, it's not that big finger kind of down at somebody and going, you're racist, you're sexist, homophobic, etc. Um, but it's actually trying to get them to, uh, again, be comfortable with being uncomfortable around um, some of these things that, that we're talking about, to hopefully you know approach it um, in, in that way whereby um, they can challenge it, they can reflect themselves, and, and thinking about it as from a growth perspective, not that fixed mindset. And I think that's that's the way we need to try and approach it. And what you're saying is be inclusive. Hmm. Simply, that is. That's, that's the sorry. Sorry, mate. Um, okay. I, I just quickly on on your point about the the shutters coming down and saying we're not saying this i think even when you haven't actually said those words you're this is racist that's already in they're already hearing that by you just communicating that you're upset quite often so i think it's really interesting in in the work that all of you are doing in the the way in which you deliver that so you don't get those shutters down immediately and that's that's what i'm really interested in because even just flagging maybe a problematic sentence that came out of someone's mouth the minute you've gone there's an issue with this. They're hearing that you're racist, you're sexist, you're homophobic, even if you haven't naturally said it. So I think the work that you, you're doing, the way you deliver it is, is the important it's thing. It's such a it? key point. What we've found is no matter which business organization we're working with, there's an incumbency. And the incumbents who are in thrall, are in influence, are in power, are in all the top decisions. When we go to Microsoft, it's the engineers. The engineers are the incumbency. We've got to find a way of including them to get any changes done. We go to L'Oreal, it's senior women. And we've got to include them and ensure their voices are heard and embrace them. Otherwise, you're going to get the shutters down. And But normally, in the UK, it's middle-class white males who are the incumbency. And what we've found, they're the first ones who are worried about any sort of bringing in parity, equity. So we've got to listen to them. We've got to hear their voices. We've got to make them feel that they're being included. And what we find is they eventually find it hard to resist. If you say, please, share with us what's making you nervous. Share with us what you'd like to see happen. How do you think that we could play this? And eventually, they become the biggest advocates. Because there's soon a realisation that it's not an exclusion zone. You are integral to what we're trying to do, but it's not just you. There's room for others here. I think it's um, something that's been missed in what I, my background is, advertising, making entertainment content. It's something that's been missing so far, I think, from the narrative around trying to bring about change in football in particular. I think it's been incredible what Gareth Southgate's done in in many ways, in showing that he's supporting the players, that there's a bit of nuance to, to some of his responses. But I just haven't seen that communication that's trying to bring people along for the journey. It's still very much, this is wrong and get with, get with the programme. It, it, that There hasn't been an effective campaign that I've seen yet that brings people that may be resistant to that, 
that change into it. And that's what I'm really interested in because as we're all saying, often those people are the people with the power. They're the people that <laughs> can actually have the agency to, to make that really big impact along with us. And, and that's like a, a thing that I'm really interested in building campaigns that bring those people along for the journey. And then, and then to your point earlier about walking off the pitch, I think it then comes down to like, what is that next objective that we're setting? We've now set a bit of a precedent in the last 12 months that this is unacceptable, that this is going on, that there's a reality that it's not necessarily getting better. What's the objective now if we carry on taking the knee, if we walk off the pitch, are we asking for bigger sanctions and repercussions? Are we asking, are we trying to bring down the amount of incidents by a certain percentage. There needs to be some, I feel, some sort of tangible objective we're working toward, as well as the big, nice, lofty ambition of everyone be nice, be inclusive, don't be racist anymore. I think there needs to be something that feels a little more tangible and then maybe walking off the pitch is the, the, the next thing. But if I think if we don't know what we're asking for, which I haven't heard people saying, this is what we want next, and it feel realistic, I think it's very very difficult to know what would happen if we if we walk off walk off the pitch because we don't actually know what we're <laughs> we're demanding that's what i'd like to see next i think some interesting things have happened but i think we're always we're always learning uh even like i'm, I'm sat here and I, I i i might have come into this going i know everything i'm gonna sit there i'm gonna tell everyone how it is but i'm listening to everyone talk and i'm like i didn't know that like but i'm all i'm also thinking now i need to go tell that to the next person that I meet and, and everybody in the room will probably do that as well. Um, I think it's not having that expectation of like, I want this now and I want to see this right now and having the extremes of both ends because uh, then we'll probably know better than Boris Johnson. If anybody likes Boris Johnson, it's a terrible choice. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to pass it to you guys now if there's any questions. Um, I don't know if there's... Is there, is there a... Sorry, I'll just give you the mic there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so if anyone's got a question, go ahead, no pressure. Um, hi, I'm Michelle Carney and I've worked in sport, professional sport, cricket. I've, I've um, as a northern, I love thin privilege. I feel your pain, rather. Um, having worked at all different levels in sport and international sport, and I, you know, I very rarely felt that I belonged. So the, the question is, and this is my frustration, I, I've just spent three years as CEO of Special Olympics in Great Britain and um, driving forward the inclusive agenda and giving people a voice and creating an inclusive environment. What I've, I've now set up, thank you, <laughs> but what, what, and I've just now set up my own business because I'm so passionate about inclusion and diversity, but the and the challenge is, and I've heard it today, it's so complex and it's so big, people don't know where to start, so don't do anything. So the, the question is really, and it goes back to, Rene, your, your point at the beginning was about cultural change and cultural shift, and that takes an awful long time. And again, as somebody who has worked in male-dominated environments, when I've raised my voice because I stand up against what's right and I stand against what's wrong. The consequences have been to me personally because when you do that to white male middle class chairs and senior leaders, you get moved on because you're the troublemaker. And you know, I've worked at two professional cricket clubs that is the reality and hasn't really moved on massively. So the, the question is really, <sighs> Where is the key bit? So who are the key people who need to be influenced and changed? Because from my experience of working with boards who say, yes, we, we're diversity and we, we're doing the tick box. And uh, a chairman I work with, um, a, a white, very middle class, upper class, said, kept saying, I've brought this Asian woman onto the board. Well, good for you. But how many women on this board actually feel they have a voice because it's you and your mate, the vice chairman, who are making all the decisions. So it's that diversity of thought, but also the fear of, if, if somebody stands up and says, actually, I haven't quite got this right, and when you're dealing with an ego as well, you kind of, you, we're expecting people to go, do you know what, actually everything I've done has not been right and that's really difficult for some people, so I'll make change. So I think it's really tough, 
But in terms of making massive change, we all have to do something differently. So there's two questions. In your opinion, where does that change need to happen for everything else to move, knowing it's not going to happen overnight and being tokenistic is, is never going to create long-term change? And secondly, if there's one thing everybody takes away from here today to do differently, what should that be? Two massive questions. No so can I have a go, Michelle? F first thing is you should be commended. Cricket is one of those areas that is the most challenging. And I think the comeuppance is coming because the game's disappearing. It's quickly, so many different formats, why? Because the standard game is disappearing. And there are some simple stats were published recently that if we just looked at black players in professional cricket in the counties, 75% have disappeared over the last four years. That's only going to lead to one way. The formats, changing formats, changing formats is hiding from changing the real issue. It's not an inclusive environment. But I, I suppose the first reflection I'd give you is that there are no universal solutions. This is what's wrong with your chief diversity officer thing. Appoint them and they're going to change it. Every single organization is different. There's no one size, one size fits no one. And sometimes in the organization, it's the chair, it's the board, it's the chief. It's who's, where does that power sit within the business in the organization? And who's the person that's the game changer? I think it was you, which is why you upset people there. Because the chief executive is where I'd go more than the board. Because they're the ones who drive change in the business. But it's different in every organization. I think. The second thing, to your second question, which I think is the most powerful question for all of us in here, every single one of us needs to look in the mirror and say, what have I done for inclusion this week? Am I really, what is it I'm actively doing? If we all get involved, this will change. I think uh, also, um, obviously in your position, what you've done is incredible, but I think if you're, like, I, I'm guilty of it as well, I sometimes look at cricket and I think this isn't happening, that isn't happening. But when I really strip it back, it's because of people like yourself. The hundred was created. The hundred actual like slogan was to get more uh, people from whichever background involved. So when you were looking in the crowd, there were really young girls there. The women's games came on before the men's game and had thousands of people watching them. And there was loads of like my my biggest fear in Test cricket is I don't want to go to Test cricket because it's surrounded either by drunks or like a bunch of old white guys who don't really want me around. But I went to the hundred and I was like. There's people from every background here and that's because of people like yourself. And I think naturally when you're in this situation or in this position, you kind of sit here and you go, oh man, I, I could do more because it's not changing in test cricket and the ECB board director is still the same person. But like along the way, there's, it's, got, it's, it's changing over time, but things like the 100 is because of people like yourself. And if you weren't there, things like that would not be happening. I was um I was just gonna have to, I have to say about cricket particularly. So I've just got a contract with Lancashire Cricket actually, who are doing a full scale DNI audit, like top to bottom change around what they want to do. So I know that it is happening in some spaces, but um what they are determined to do is not only make things better but set an example for cricket, for sport. So it's there. I had to mention that because it's it's relevant and I want wanted people to know. Let's definitely have a chat. Amazing. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sam from Watford Football Club. Um, thank you all for speaking today. So many takeaways um, and I'm sure all of us will um, say the same thing. My question is about, um, we spoke a lot about football, so sorry for those who aren't football fans. <laughs> um, working for a football club, there's lots of initiatives, lots of everything, um, kick it out, no room for racism, not today, any day. At Watford Football Club we put our own initiative forward because we wanted to be accountable um, especially for our first team men's players and the racism they received at the FA Cup uh, semi-final against Wolves. But basically, this initiative is a we campaign and we partnership with Hearts Police Hate Crime Unit and it's all about education and getting justice. And 
I just wanted to ask, we're working on getting justice, but the educational route, and we really struggle to get accountability. We really struggle. There's so many times where I get contacted and say, this investigation can't go any further, it can't progress due to lack of evidence. And I'm sick and tired of it, and my colleagues are too. Um, and it's really disheartening to go to people who've taken the time to report something to a steward at half time that they've witnessed something and um, and then to go back to them and say thank you for putting yourself in that position in a game where you've seen something within the fans um, but unfortunately we can't do anything more and it's a police matter so yes we can identify people when we get that information we can invite people in and we have done we've invited people in use the ethos of the club our values to educate but I just feel like without a outcome without something substantial being convicted is the education enough and in your experiences in what you've seen what, what's your, your don't opinion? be so hard on yourself Sam <laughs> look you, you have to start somewhere and the fact that you've created the education, the awareness, publicize it, talk about it, make it public that you're doing that. It's a shame that the outcome's not there. Don't give up on this. I'm a Chelsea season ticket holder. I can't tell you how tough it's been to be a Chelsea season ticket holder in terms of race. That was a terrible yeah. choice. <laughs> Champions League, mate. So, so, 30, <laughs> so 30 years and we had an experience similar to yours. We went to Wembley. We're playing Everton. Louis R scores in 0.3 seconds. And someone behind, went to Chelsea, and someone behind me shouts out, says, some, Mikel, you black bastard. I'm the only black fan in our area. The place froze. Two minutes later, a Chelsea steward comes down and says, we've got a re recording of someone swearing here. Would you like me to throw them out? And I said to him, why is it my problem? Why have you come to me? And a woman behind me with a two 11-year-old twin girl, she said, I'd like them thrown out. And that was, Chelsea wrote about it in the next match program. And was someone convicted? No, but it started a change. It started a conversation. Because it's not my problem, it's our problem. And the fact that she was so brave to say it, it started a ripple effect around the club. And we started talking about it. Then, after all, everyone puts their hand up now. When something happens anywhere in the ground, we're all putting our hands and we're supported by other fans around the place. It's taking years, but it makes all of us feel that we need to stand up and support the person, whatever the, the incident is. So I think you've started something. Be a little patient. And I think but that, don't give up on it. Yeah, I think that's the key thing is that um, we... Uh, there was an incident, I won't mention the club stadium, but uh, where there was a homophobic slur that was shouted out and it was the uh, um, one of the match officials on the touchline that, uh, that had heard it. And I think it's shifted in a way, it doesn't have to be the targeted person that reports it or takes offence to it, whichever way you want to go, but if it's unacceptable behaviour, you know, then it needs to be dealt with. And I think the, the fans are the most difficult one, I think, to, to deal with. But um, and by the way, you're doing some great work at Watford. I admire a lot of your programmes. But I think I've got quite a unique perspective on this. So coming from an anti-racism charity that used, used to criticise the association I'm now working for um, uh, around uh, dealing with some things, but actually coming in within the organisation and actually seeing some of the difficulties because I think there's been a, a shift in terms of on the pitch now. Um, in recent times where you're not seeing as much as the overt, you know, somebody shouting something at another player across the pitch. People are a, a lot more aware of maybe of the consequences now. So it's the little quiet word in someone's ear. Now, the difficulty for us is, um, you know, player A said, player B has said something, match officials haven't heard it, no one else has heard it. How could we possibly sanction on that? And, you know, it's always really tough, and, and that's the hard one. And you know, we've brought in um, so is mandatory education for for any sanctions that that uh, that we have within Wales. But we've brought in that th those situations, and let's be fair, more often than not, something happens on the pitches. Normally, you know, a bit of a scuffle will break out, and uh, the reaction, as as you would imagine, now you know something has happened. So we're kind of looking in. Well, you know, can we? I say enforce, but 
put on mandatory education, even if we can't prove that something happened. Now, I know we're getting a little bit of a grey area, but we're trying to approach it in a way of we're, we're doing a lot of proactive education anyway. We've got a new education programme throughout the year that we're launching, but trying to communicate out that, look, you're going to get in this education anyway. And, and we found generally, even those that, you know, have clearly said they haven't said anything, but actually how you communicate out are receiving that um, and, and are taking up those opportunities for training. Um, and, and even the one-to-one -one sessions I've had with those individuals who have been sanctioned and whether they've admitted it or not. Um, again, they've, they've been received quite well. So I, I think that's the challenge. But the fans one is, is a difficult one. And we had an incident a couple of years back where I think we need to get more fans to police it themselves because... Technology is great in stadiums and at the Cardiff City Stadium, there's cameras everywhere and mics and, and generally if anything happens, it generally gets picked up, not always. But what we need is we need more fans to report it themselves and challenge it themselves because there's nothing more powerful than your own fans challenging one of your own fans, um, any attitudes and things. I think we're all out of time. Um, I think James is going to hop up, hop up here, I imagine. Yeah. Um, thank you everyone uh, for listening, for the questions. I imagine some of you guys might want to hang around. Uh, I'm more than happy to carry this conversation on uh, all day if you like. Uh, thanks to the panel as well. You've all been class. And as I say, we're all learning. I don't think anything's going to happen overnight. But like Sam, like Michelle, like all of you guys are probably doing something out there. Um, it won't happen tomorrow. It might happen in 10 years. It might happen in our kids' lifetimes or our nephews or nieces. But as long as it happens, you've done your bit. Um, so thank you for everyone being out here. And James, over to you. I'll bring it to you. Um, yeah, I just want to look to echo uh, Nubay's comments there. I really want to thank everyone. I can't thank the panel enough. I mean, I've been working, uh, obviously, we'd be on the white line now for three years, and I've learned more again today. I find it insightful, educational, thought provoking, emotional, to be honest. Um, I think, from my perspective, I'd just like to say this for some of you in the room, it might resonate with like, I didn't have all the answers. I mean, I fit into a certain description framework that was sort of preordained and and I came at it just from a human level like it certain things didn't sit okay with me um just in my DNA and my fiber in the fabric of who I am as a person I wanted to affect change I didn't necessarily know the right way to go about it so I went about educating myself and it's an ongoing piece that's where we can all make a difference you don't have to have all the answers that's why I assembled an incredible group of people because I don't I mean it would have been ridiculous for me to have stood up there and try and run this day to day um, so it's a it's a constant evolution but we can all do more and do our bit and 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 go beyond just like some of the earlier comments you know ticking that box well you know I've, I've done my little bit around racism so you know gender doesn't matter or this and that and and so there's so much I'd love to unpack with you now but now it's not the time um, we are staying around if anyone wants to network there's some incredible people in the room I want a big massive thank you to also our partners I mean the club group who are one of our sponsors today I, we there's gonna be more excited Emma's in the room here who's the founder of the club group there's gonna be more exciting announcements around that partnership and plans for going not just this year going into next year so please connect to them and, and obviously keep an eye out for updates on that uh, global asset portfolio who are also our partners um, again massive thanks to them without people like this today wouldn't happen um, I'll just just let Jamie do a little plug uh, because it's important and relevant. I mean, everyone on this panel is doing incredible work. Um, Jamie's got something super relevant that's happening next year that might be of interest to, to you all. But thank you so much for everything that you do and supporting us. And uh, yeah, Jamie, it's all yours. Well, be quick. And you guys are going to be a part of it, which is why it's definitely relevant. And thank thank you for pulling us together today. I've already made new connections and met new people, and this is is really important and quite humbling to be back in a room with people after everything. Um, but hopefully today, website permitting, um, my colleague and I are going to be launching the first specific uh, equality, diversity, inclusion event for the sports sector. So that's six months today. So it's 8th, 9th of March um, next year in Birmingham. Um, and it will be the UK's biggest only equality, diversity conference for the sports sector. Our mission there is to get a million underprivileged and underrepresented young people into sport. Um, and there'll be so much more coming. If you're interested in being involved in that, have partners you think might be interested, um, building speakers, kind of exhibition showcasing, please ask me about it. Um, look out for it across social media. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for that.
I'm so grateful for today. So thank you to everyone. Nabe, thank you for hosting. Thank you. So much.